Greetings. I bring a hearty Buckeye welcome to the nearly 1,000 friends, researchers, colleagues, scholars, and community members from all around the United States joining us today. My name is James Moore, and I am the Vice Provost for Diversity and Inclusion and Chief Diversity Officer at The Ohio State University. I'd like to welcome you all to our annual President and Provost Diversity Lecture in Culture Arts Series. This is our 22nd year, but our first voyage into this virtual format. I'd like to thank my special events team headed by Rose Wilson Hill for all they did to pull this event together. We're going to be hearing in a few minutes from Reverend Dr. William Barber II, an icon, minister, and social justice advocate. As we consider how best to turn passionate protests into actionable policy, it's important to hear from people like Reverend Barber, the leader of a diverse coalition that fought racial and economic inequality in North Carolina and beyond. As we look for leadership in this front, we must recognize there is work to do in our own house. We must improve our own policies, procedures, processes, and practices that act as barriers to inequity. To that end, Ohio State has convened the Task Force for Racism and Racial Inequities led by myself and Dr. Tom Gregoire, the Dean of Social Work. Before we hear from Reverend Barker, Barber, I would like to acknowledge and recognize my supervisor, Executive Vice President and Provost Bruce McFerrin, and our co-host, Center for Ethics and Human Values, the College of Social Work, the Kerwin Institute for Study of Race and Ethnicity, as well as our very own John Glenn College of Public Policy. I'd like to also introduce a special university leader who has joined us today to say a few words, our 16th president, Dr. Christina Johnson, an engineer, inventor, entrepreneur. President Johnson brings decades of a cross section of experiences from the academic, business, and public policy sectors. Since she has arrived this fall, I've had a chance to visit with President Johnson, and I know that she is someone who's truly committed to the hard work of creating an inclusive opportunities for all. Folks, she is the real deal. She's also on the cover in a really terrific issue of the Ohio State alumni magazine that hit mailboxes earlier this month. I learned from that story uh, about President Johnson's impressive credentials, impressive credentials, but also the integrity, passion, and courage have been the hallmarks of her career. Tucked away in that magazine, I also ran across a fascinating story about President Johnson's paternal grandfather, Charles Johnson, who was an 1896 Ohio State engineering graduate and a member of the Buckeye football team. It seems that our grandfather went on to have a successful engineering career working with George Westinghouse in the early 1900s. Yes, I said the early 1900s, but he was also recognized uh, also recognized the systemic unfairness of an educational system that did not allow women and Blacks the opportunities to pick up technical skills like engineering. So he took it upon himself to start a technical night school to try to bring new skills, knowledge, and career opportunities to folks who look far different than himself. The great truth is there have always been those ahead of their time who bent the arc towards justice in their own way. And here is a great example from a man who lived a full century ago who did that very thing. It is a wonderful story and I encourage you to read that issue of the alumni magazine. 
I'm sure President Johnson and all the other members of her beloved family are extremely proud of her grandfather's legacy. We're proud to have President Johnson and her lovely wife, Veronica, as a part of our Buckeye family. And we wish them the absolute best as they get settled in Columbus life. I now relinquish the mic to our 16th president, President Christina Johnson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore, for that really personal introduction. I very much appreciate it. And I'd like to thank you and your team for hosting this event on behalf of the president and the provost. As Dr. Moore mentioned, we have over or nearly a thousand guests tonight. So thank you all for joining us and also for submitting 300 questions for the Q&A session, uh, which is awesome. And it's really powerful and it's a powerful example of the kind of engagement that we're hoping to achieve with this annual event. At Ohio State in our communities and people everywhere are gathering to discuss society's most pressing issues. Thanks to programs like the President and Provost Diversity Lecture and Cultural Arts Series. For 22 years, this event has connected the community with thought leaders dedicated to advancing diversity and inclusive excellence. We've been honored to have some of the most distinguished scholars leading the charge on this work across the nation and around the world. Previous guests include Colin Powell, award-winning essayist and novelist Zadie Smith, astronaut Mae Jameson, and my dear friend, Dr. Freeman Rabowski, president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Tonight, I have the privilege of introducing our next outstanding speaker in this important series, Dr. Reverend, Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II. He is the pastor of Greenleaf Christian Church, former president of the North Carolina NAACP, and founder of the morality-based leadership development organization, Repairs of the Breach. Dr. Barber is a man of deep faith and principle, an advocate for individuals and communities impacted by the most important and critical challenges of our time, systemic racism, poverty, social justice, environmental degradation, and voter suppression, to mention a few. He understands that excellence is a habit. It's a habit of doing your best every day, not just a single achievement, and that we must ask the very best of ourselves in everything we do, particularly in the way we treat and care for one another. He embodies an incredible sense of urgency to affect change, and he embraces the power of inclusive coalitions to stand for what is right. We see this time and again throughout his life, in his writings, in his achievements, in his teachings, and in his actions. The Moral Monday rallies are one such example in which he led outside the North Carolina State House to protest the regressive and divisive laws that are chipping away at progress, justice, freedom, and fairness. The rally spread throughout the state and across the South, growing to include tens of thousands of activists and were ultimately successful in helping to challenge voter suppression and racial gerrymandering before the Supreme Court. In 2017, Dr. Barber further expanded nonviolent civil disobedience when he launched a revival of the 1968 Poor People's Campaign. Once again, using the lessons he learned throughout his life to make people's lives better. As I mentioned earlier, he's an accomplished author and also a 2018 MacArthur Fellow, a 2018 Tar Heel of the Year, and an Auburn Seminary Senior Fellow. He earned his bachelor's degree from North Carolina Central University, a Master of Divinity from Duke University, a Doctor of Ministry from Drew University, and I'm so excited to welcome him tonight, albeit virtually, to The Ohio State University. Dr. Barber, before you begin, I want you to know that when Buckeyes do something, we make, it, we make a big impact and we do it big. So everyone tuning in, please listen and envision how you will take what we learned tonight and change the world. Even in the most difficult times, we must lift up others through our words and our actions. So let's do all that we can to move forward Dr. Barber's message and his work and from whichever or wherever you happen to be joining us, extend to Dr. Barber a very warm Buckeye welcome. Dr. Barber.
Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. I'm so honored to be at the Ohio State. <laughs> and Dr. James Moore, uh, you might be kin to me. My grandfather, my step-grandfather was actually a Moore. Now, we may have a little trouble. I was born in Indiana, so I'm a Hoosier. And so uh, we're gonna see how this proceeds <laughs> with, a, with a Hoosier being on Buckeye territory. <laughs> I do also want to acknowledge all of the 300 questions. That's incredible. And uh, I hope I get a chance that we can answer them all to see them. And would love to try to take a shot at sending some of them back through various means of social media. Because of time, I'm going to forego any other further intro comments, but simply to say how humble I am on behalf of the movement to be with you today. I want to talk about America's future demands a poor people's campaign, a third reconstruction and the moral revival. If we are to be the promise of America, we must address systemic racism and how it connects to four other interlocking injustices that I wanna lift up today. The truth of the matter is I believe that we are in a battle for the soul of America. Since the rejection election of 2016, when forms of white rage propelled the candidate who was endorsed by white supremacists, the KKK, all the way to the Republican National Convention and onto the White House, race has been ever before us in America. And yet, if you think about it, out of all the presidential debates from 2016 and even this year, we've not spent one hour or even 30 minutes wrestling with the issue of systemic racism in all of its format or systemic poverty. Now, our national conversation about racism has sometimes become confused in the post Charlottesville debate about whether or not there were good people on both sides. Every politician in America that has any basic political sense condemned hate, hate after Charlottesville, but racism is not just about overt hate. Sometimes we have even con con uh, con tried to suggest that if you address police brutality, you have addressed the fullness of police of racism but as horrific, horrible, and abhorrent police brutality is towards people of color, even that does not fully penetrate what systemic racism is. As I said, racism is not just about overt hate. Did you, you hear ever hear Richard Spencer, the white supremacist, when he went back to Charlottesville, he actually said, we came peaceably and we will come peaceably again. He said racism peacefully again. Racism, you see, isn't about whether you have a black friend or you use the N-word or you condone overt acts of racism. Institutional racism is about what's written into policy. My good friend Ibram Kendi says racism ultimately is not about bad people, it's about bad policy. Even this morning, the current candidate for the Supreme Court said she abhors racism. She has actually adopted two black children, but in policy, she has supported voter suppression. In policy, she's even said it's all right for a felon to retain a gun rights, but a felon should not retain voting rights. Racism, systemic racism is about power from the inception of slavery in this country, racism was ultimately about evil economics. And that is the money justifies the means. Sick sociology, that is certain people couldn't be on the same level and be around each other. It was also about political pathology where po politics and the decisions of politics were designed to protect a power structure. It was about, um, what we call heretical ontology, and that is that God intended it 
to be this way. It was about bad biology that people based on their just basic DNA are different. And it was about the meanness and madness of military might used to enforce racism and slavery. It's about power. After the civil rights movement, if I might come forward, there were certain white forces, people who were afraid of losing power and they learn how to perpetuate the cult of racism without appearing to be racist. Code words and dog whistles were developed. The Southern strategy was a strategy deliberately designed to play the race card in a way to drive Southern whites to vote for con so-called conservative white politicians and leave the ranks of the Democratic Party that had elected people like John Kennedy and Lyndon Baines Johnson, who had helped usher in some of the public policy goals and demands of the civil rights movement. In a starkly revealing interview, former GOP strategist Lee Atwater boldly described how the Southern strategy worked to undermine fusion type movements that brought people together regardless of their race, which had built up and expanded democracy during the first two reconstructions, the one between 1868 and 1896, and the reconstruction between 1954 and, 18, and 1965. He said, in his words, you start out in 1954 saying nigger, 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 but by 1968, Atwater said, you can't say nigger, that hurts you, so it backfires. So you start talking about things like force busting, states' rights, and all that stuff. He said, then you get really abstract and you talk about cutting taxes. And all these things you're talking about sound like they're just economic things, but the byproduct of them is blacks get hurt worse than whites and whites begin to blame blacks for their economic trouble. The target of this Southern strategy was initially the states of the old Confederacy with the goal of developing a solid South to ensure that the majority of Southern whites would resist and repeal any fusion alliances with African-Americans and Latinos. But it turned out that race baiting worked in other parts of the country too. For instance, in Wisconsin's Democratic primary in 1964, more than a third of the state's Democrats cast their ballots for an open racist named George Wallace, the man who had gained national attention by saying segregation yesterday, today, and tomorrow in February of 1963. Three weeks later, Wallace landed 30% of the votes cast in, in an Indiana primary where two Ku Klux Klansmen ran a shoestring campaign out of a service station phone book. In the Maryland Democratic primary, Wallace won 16 of the state's 23 counties and 43% of the final tally. And he said that without the quote vote, I won't say it again, Wallace argued he would have won the whole thing. Wallace's surprising performance suggested to Republican George H.W. Bush that the volcanic white oppression to the Democratic Party's embrace of civil rights opened the door for Republicans in the solid South. A hopeful Bush decided to run for the U.S. Senate, though he had never held elected office before, and Bush then declared himself emph em em emphatically opposed to the Civil Rights Act of 64, saying that the Civil Rights Act of 64 trampled on the Constitution by mandating equal access to restaurants, hotels, restrooms, and other public accommodation. Bush explained to a crowd, this is in the 60s, the new Civil Rights Act was passed to protect 14% of the people. I'm worried about the other 86%. This is the kind of gentler white supremacy that brought Strom Thurmond and the Dixiecrats into the Republican Party paving the way for the campaigns of Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, and the Bushes, all of whom employed the same political operatives and the same divide and conquer tactics. And when they no longer could be outwardly or uh, even about the racist side, they turned to be against abortion and against gay people. But all of that flowed out of the original uh, being against civil rights. As Ibram Kendi has documented in his monumental history, stamped from the beginning, this hypocritical contradiction was written into law before it was justified by racist ideas. The law came first, the racist ideas came as the justification. Racism began, became as American as apple pie because it made sense 
of the hypocrisy that made plantations work and plantation capitalism work. Now it is commonplace for commentators on American politics today to lament our polarization. Oh, it's so divided. And to talk of racism as mere cultural dislike rather than intentional systems. To act as though a current president is racist and to act as though this is new. So-called conservatives and liberals alike express their desire to get back to less chaotic days before Donald Trump. But the Trump presidency did not create America's racial divide. It exploited the tactics that were developed alongside the racist policies and the ideas that emerged with American slavery and continued through Jim Crow and the Southern strategy even up until this day. What we see, the fruit, what we see is the fruit or of these tactics in the disparate impact of policy decision about voting, the courts, and economic inequality today. What we see today are the fruits of the decision to sow racial division for power rather than deal with issues of race and poverty impacting all Americans. What we see today are the fruits of policy rooted in a lust for power over and above a love for justice. What, we, what the lust leads some, what the lust has done for power, it has led some to establish injustice, to refuse the common defense, to promote the welfare of a few, to ensure domestic division, and to limit equal protection under the law. So don't let anybody tell you that the problem is just Trump. Yes, he has embraced and emboldened white nationalists who've rallied in Charlottesville and elsewhere. Yes, he has emboldened it by his refusal to call down racist police brutality. But there was a precedent set long before Trump mastered the con of the Southern strategy. And yes, it's a con. Truth is, he and his audience, the audience that he has, has been cultivated for 50 years. The truth of the matter is, if you go back to uh, a memo that was written in the 1960s by Buchanan and a guy by the name of Kevin Phillips, they wrote a, a memo to Richard Nixon and they called it positive polarization. And basically they said, all you have to do to win is find out who hates who, you play in that division, you exploit it, and that's how you hold on to power. If we do this, we can split, particularly the Democratic Party in the South, make it so-called the party of black folk, drive white people away, force people apart from each other who really ought to be allies, particularly in fighting against poverty. This is what was sown in the wind, and now we're reaping the whirlwind. Dr. King told us something in 1965. We often don't even talk about it because people are so enamored by the I Have a Dream speech and they don't realize that even I Have a Dream speech wasn't named I Have a Dream speech. It was normalcy is no longer acceptable or normalcy no more. The I Have a Dream was an ending, not the entire speech. In this speech, he dealt with economic injustice and police brutality and why it was still existing 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation. That's what King was wrestling with. And in 1965, when he got to the end of the Selma to Montgomery March, on the steps of the Alabama State House, Dr. King said something to us that we need to hear today because it will help us understand what we're seeing now. This is what he said. He said, it may be said of the Reconstruction era that the Southern aristocracy took the world and gave the poor white man Jim Crow. He gave him Jim Crow, and when his wrinkled stomach cried out that, that, for the food that his empty pockets could not provide, he ate Jim Crow, a psychological bird that told him that no matter how bad off he was, he was a white man better than a black man. He ate Jim Crow. And when his undernourished children cried out for the necessity that his low wages could provide, he did not organize with black people to get better wages. They showed him Jim Crow to keep that organization from happening. And so he fed on it. Thus, Dr. King says, listen to this, the threat of the free exercise of the ballot by the Negro and the white masses alike resulted in the establishment of a segregated society. 
Every time there was the possibility of the Negro and the white masses of the South to unite and build a great society, segregation was deliberately sown by the aristocracy, by the bourbon class, by the wealthy to undermine that alliance. We must understand the challenge of systemic racism if we think we misunderstand the challenge of systemic racism if we think then that it's just about a dislike of black people. No, systemic racism is a dislike for democracy, a dislike for a more perfect union. It's a dislike for humanity. That's why even today you can be black and embrace and encourage white nationalism and systemic racism. Systemic racism is simply the perpetuation of a system where the ideal of whiteness and white power are the norm in common life. It is to accept the heresy that some people are not made in the image and likeness of God, therefore they should not benefit from the social and political policies of the country. This is why since the United States Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act in the summer of 2013, there has been an all out assault on voting rights in this country. And be, and be mindful, I'm a theologian, I'm a public theologian. The assault on voting rights is both a political and a theological issue. It is a theological issue because we only give the right to vote to people born 18 years old, born or naturalized in these United States. We do not give the right to vote to pe pets, parakeets, and puppies. So when the vote is suppressed deliberately, that is actually a form of idolatry and self-worship because it suggests that you believe you have the right to suppress somebody else's vote, i.e. they must not be a full person and therefore you have the right to suppress their participation in the democracy. Since 2013, we've had 868. That's how many fewer voting sites we had in black and brown poor communities in 2016. 22, that's the number of states who have passed racist voter suppression since 2013. 26 is the number since 2010. That's, that's over, that's um, 52 uh, United States senators and they're over 50%, 50 percent, 50 some percent of the United States House of Representatives. More than seven years, actually today, over 2,600, nearly 700 days has Mitch McConnell refused to fix the Voting Rights Act that could have been fixed on June 26, 2013. Now, Strom Thurmond only filibustered the Civil Rights Act of 1957 for 24 hours. McConnell has filibustered fixing it for over seven years. We call Strom Thurmond a racist. This is the election hacking that nobody wants to talk about. Why? Because it would mean America would have to deal with systemic racism beyond just incidents like Charlottesville and even beyond some things with police brutality. It would mean many people, many people would understand that voter suppression in and of itself is a strenuous form of systemic racism. Racism may not come across as overt, it's often promoted as just protecting the ballot, but the truth of the matter, this is the hacking. Now, I don't know how much help Trump got from Russia, but it is manifestly clear that he could not have stolen the election without the help of systemic racism. Some talk about the current president winning Wisconsin by 30,000 votes in, 20, in 2016. But in, in, in Berman's book, uh, Give Us the Ballot, he, he footnotes that there were 250,000 votes suppressed in Wisconsin. In North Carolina, we had over 150 fewer sites to vote, early voting, mostly in black and brown communities. And whether the tactics are partisan gerrymandering, a discriminatory voter ID requirement, or the rollback of early voting and same day registration, the fact of the matter is racist voter suppression is the, is the ultimate hacking of our system. Now you must understand, why is this, why does this, this tactic use? Well, from Maryland to Texas, there are 193 electoral college votes in the South and Southeast. 
That means that if any group can lock up these southern southeastern states, that you lock up 193 electoral college votes, you only need 77 from the other 35 states to get to 270. But what you should also know is that these are the same states where one third of all poor people live, one third of all white poor people live, and where a small percentage of poor and low wealth people organized across racial lines could fundamentally change the outcome of elections from state legislatures to the Congress to the president. What else do we know about these same states? We know that all of these states, these states from Maryland to Texas, are racist voter suppression states. But here, my friends, is the other side of racism and, is, and, and, and the part that you also must know and how racism hurts white people, poor white people, poor brown people, poor indigenous people, and low wealth people. Racism, systemic racism, particularly through voter suppression, allows ecological devastation and the polluting of our society. It allows the war economy. It allows uh, the denial of health care it, because it gives access, racist voter suppression, to, govern, to the government, to those who promote a distorted, immoral, religious nationalism as well. In the places where we see a racist surgical attack on voting rights in America, all uh, are all the same places where we see the highest levels of poverty. If I had time, I would put up maps and show this to you empirically. The same states that are racist voter suppression states are the same states that have the highest level of poverty. Notice I didn't say black poverty, poverty. They're also the same states that have the greatest denial of health care and living wages. The same states that have the greatest attack on public education and union rights. And in all of them, not in the South, Ohio was, has been a voter suppression state. Your former uh, governor who was in the House of Representatives uh, was also a voter suppressionist. The, the states that are the worst voter suppression states are the states with the greatest attacks on the LGBT community and on the immigrant community. The states with the rate, worst voter suppression record, racist voter suppression record, are the states where we have the highest density of prison and the highest density of polluters, corporate polluters that are allowed to almost roam free and creating ecological devastation. The states that are the worst vote, racist voter suppression states also have the highest level of so-called white evangelicals who push nationalism. And that this president and others sit in the Senate and in the House benefited from the racist electoral college and voter suppression. It allows these major political bodies to be stacked, not because people win the majority of the vote, but because so much of the vote is suppressed. And what does that do? That then allows people in the Senate, for instance, to stack the court, which is why right now the states that have the least amount of the population have the greatest ability to stack the court. And where are we? Where are we after all of this Southern strategy and after all of this intentional racism that, that plays itself out first through racist voter suppression and then in so many other areas? Where are we now? Well, where are we now in poverty? The war on poverty was in the 60s. Where are we now? We ended that war. And what do we have now? 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country. And 66 million of them are white, 26 million are black. Even though 61% of black people are poor and low wealth, about 30% of white people are poor and low wealth. So the larger percentage of poor and low people are white, but in raw numbers, it's actually more whites who are poor. The average poor person is white woman, a white woman and disabled. 62 million people in this country right now earn less than a living wage. 700 people dying from poverty each day before COVID. 700 people were dying a day from poverty before COVID. 87 million people uninsured or underinsured before COVID. Before COVID. And now some 27 million people have lost health care because it was tied to their employer. Since COVID, 7.75 million cases, 214,000 deaths, 400,000 projected deaths by February. Between April and July, 
an estimated 2 million workers lost access to health insurance. COVID, highest rate of deaths are among black people, 97 deaths out of every 100,000 people. But in raw numbers, there have been 94,000 white deaths, 40,000 black deaths. So there's actually 54,000 more whites who died from COVID in raw numbers. Where are we now? with this political system that allows people to get into office through racist voter suppression, who then block health care, block living wages, so forth and so on. Columbia University says that 36,000 lives could have been saved by May. Where are we now? 12 million, 12, about 30 million people are unemployed and growing. And for every available job position, there are two applicants. Where are we now? Unemployment for the poor has doubled while the national unemployment in August 2020 was about 8.4%. Unemployment among poor and low-wealth people was 15%. 13 million poor and low-income people reported not having enough food to eat in August. The SNAP enrollment food stamps expanded by 5 million to more than 42 million people. Where are we now? We passed the CARES Act. In March, and 84% of the money goes to banks and corporations. Three to four trillion dollars have been transferred to the banks, while essential workers do not get the essentials that they need: sick guarantees, sick leave, unemployment, living wages. Where are we now? Where are we now? The programs we have passed have left out 11 million undocumented people. Where are we now? The direct payments of $1,200 are over. There was no full relent, re, rent relief and mortgage relief and utility relief. Where are we now? Billionaires have made $840 billion since March. While there is still no guaranteed health care, no guaranteed housing, no guaranteed income, no guarantee that everybody has a right to live in this country. And how did many of the people get the power that they have to, to deny policies that would help people through systemic racism? Racist voter suppression. Mm. Public health officials have actually said that there are three re reasons public health officials say that COVID is so terrible for us. First, the inopt, almost criminal response of the White House and members of the Senate. But then they also say the fissures, fissures of systemic racism and poverty that existed prior to COVID actually give COVID a place to continue to grow. If you don't address the systemic racism and systemic poverty, you actually end up enabling COVID. And so we heard George Floyd say, I can't breathe. Just, just a few years ago, we heard Eric Garner utter the same words. But the chokehold we have witnessed in these instances of police violence has also gripped millions through the interlocking injustices of American inequality through systemic racism and poverty. Breonna Taylor was killed off camera. But the policies promoted by many who hold power in large part because of racist voter suppression is snuffing out the life of untold thousands who we hold in our hearts, minds, and spirit who never will be viewed on camera. Over a century ago, Dr. King said in our society, it is murder to deprive a person of a job or an income. And now millions of people are being strangled that way. Millions of people have been crying I can't breathe. Far too long, this nation has refused to hear them. Where are we today? We look at the rush to fill a Supreme seat before providing a stimulus. And we know that the Federalist Society has worked for the past 40 years. McConnell has worked private, privately and quietly to stack the courts. The Senate is controlled by people who got 16 million less votes. The presidency is controlled by a person who lost the popular vote. The Supreme Court majority can be shifted now by a new appointee and 90 to 99% of the decisions of those who get appointed by McConnell and others, they, they rule on the side of corporations and against voting rights and civil rights. And so where must we go? if we're gonna be a genuine democracy. We need not so much a reckoning, I hear that word a lot, 
but we need a third reconstruction, a moral revival, and a poor people's campaign guided by a policy platform to address five interlocking injustices simultaneously, systemic racism in all of its format, voter suppression, mass incarceration, resegregation of public schools, continued attack on the indigenous community and, and our Latino brothers and sisters, police brutality, all of it, that's systemic racism. And then systemic poverty, and then ecological devastation, denial of health care. And then the war economy, because we're spending $800 billion in war. If we cut our military budget, and if we were to just cut it in half, if we did that, we still have more money than China, North Korea, Russia, Iran, and Iraq combined. One co military contract could provide health care for every state that denied Med the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid expansion. And then we have to address this distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism. And how are we going to do that? Well, I, we believe that we've got to first protect and expand voting rights. We need a preclearance formula that catches all the jurisdictions covered formally by the Voting Rights Act and then those who need to be covered. We must address police violence and mass incarceration and resegregation of schools. We must have a meaningful recognition of indigenous sovereignty and we must have just immigration policies. Two, we must have health care for all. That includes a Medicare for all expansion of Medicaid and universal coverage for COVID treatment and vaccine. This includes fully funding and expanding Indian health services to meet the needed hand. And let me just say, this is not socialism. It's amazing to me when you talk, when Jesus talks about poverty and lifting up the sick, we call it Christianity. When somebody else does, they call it socialism. This is not socialism. It is doing right. It's the establishment of justice. It's constitutional. It's providing for the common defense and promoted the general welfare. Number three, we need housing for all. Expand public housing and affordable housing. Expand rental assistance. We got 30 some million, 40 million people now facing eviction, facing evictions. We need jobs and incomes for all. We must establish a federal jobs guarantee that can build up health care and infrastructure capacity in schools and sanitation, water and climate infrastructure, including public transportation. We must get $15 an hour and a union, pay people a living wage. If we did that tomorrow, 49 million people would rise up out of poverty and low wealth and $368 billion would be pumped into our economy. We need guaranteed adequate income for those who cannot work with their meaningful engagement, prioritize poor and low income communities that have suffered from deindustrialization, rural communities that are dependent on fossil fuel and native or indigenous communities. We need special investments. We need to establish strong welfare programs for those who cannot earn an adequate income through work because of caregiving and disability and other reasons. We need immigration reform. We need to institute meaningful immigration reform that prioritizes family reunification and valid documentation and timely citizenships while also ending mandatory deportations and detention. We need to move resources away from the border wall into border communities, ensure that immigrants are eligible for all public assistance and welfare programs, including health care and unemployment and housing and food security and child care program and education and worker protection. And we need to stop lying on immigrants. Immigrants actually pay taxes. Many of them have paid into Social Security that they will never receive. We must demand, and it must be made clear, that all of this can be funded through cuts in our military spending. We spend 54 cents of every discretionary dollar on the war economy, not even going to the troops, but on the war economy, on the corporate uh, war economy, what um, Eisenhower called the Congressional Military Industrial Complex. We need to change that and redirect those sources, resources, redirect them to building up our community. 54 cents of every dollar going to war economy, less than 16 cents of every dollar going to education, infrastructure, and health care. That is a form of spiritual and economic death. And then we must challenge this false moral narrative of religious nationalism and know that a limited nativism has never worked and it will not work today. And this reconstruction must, must include not merely policies, but a change in the faces and the people who make the policies. That's what reconstruction is really about. Poor and low wealth communities must have representation in the places of power. And that can happen when we change voter suppression, poor and low wealth people. 
Now, finally, what is the power that poor and low-wealth people and their allies, moral and advocates have? Well, even the Pope said past in a few Sundays ago in his encyclical, the poor people's campaign was a necessity. He said, the world is going backward. This is Pope, Pope Francis. And we need a mobilization of poor and low-wealth people. The only group who could form the massive restructure of American society would be blacks, poor whites, working class folks, and even recipients of welfare. This is what King said, and it's even true today. The only coalition that can shift where we are is for blacks, and whites, and natives, and Latino, and gay and straight and young, and old, people of faith, people not of faith, and people from every geography, poor and low wealth, to come together. It's the only way. Neoliberalism is not going to work, just lifting from the middle and believing everybody else is going to be all right. Trickle down is not going to work because things never trickle down. Hate meeting hate, us just hating people that have wealth or have, have uh, 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 or just hating our adversaries, that's not going to work either. Just addressing police brutality alone is not going to be the solution either. Black people getting in organizations by themselves is not going to work either. White people trying to just do it on behalf of he's not going to work either. That's why we are building a moral fusion coalition rooted in 14 points. Number one, we have to have a movement that engages in indigenously led grassroots organizing from the states up because change never happened from DC down alone. It came from, from Selma and Montgomery and Birmingham up. Number two, we must use moral language to frame and critique public policy, regardless of who's in power. This language of left and right and conservative and liberal is too puny for what we are having to address today. Number three, we have to demonstrate a commitment to civil disobedience, but it must follow the steps of nonviolent action and a design to change public conversation, change the narrative, and change the consciousness. Number four, we must build a stage from which to lift the voices of everyday people impacted by immoral policy, not just people speaking on behalf of them. Number five, we must recognize the centrality of race. America's first and se uh, second reconstruction sought to heal the wound of race-based slavery, but um, race is America's original sin. And any issue we're gonna deal with, we have to deal with the centrality of race. Number six, we must build a broad, diverse coalition, including moral and religious leaders of all faith. Number seven, we must intentionally diversify the movement with the goals of winning unlikely allies. Number eight, we must build transform, transformative long-term fusion coalitions rooted in deep relationships with a clear example agenda that doesn't measure success only by electoral outcomes. Number nine, we must make serious commitment to academic and empirical analysis of policy. We can't just shout and be loud. We gotta be right. We gotta know the facts. We gotta have the footnote. Number 10, we must coordinate and use all forms of social media, video, text, Twitter, Facebook, everything. Number 11, we must engage in massive voter registration and education. Number 12, we must pursue a strong legal strategy. Number 13, we must engage the cultural arts to teach and to envision a new way. And number 14, we must resist the one moment mentality and we must build a movement. We are charged in this moment to go forth and go forward knowing that we have the power to unleash the power of poor and low wealth. Do you realize, as I close, we talk a lot about what happened in 2016, but nationwide, 100 million people didn't vote. 100 million. Poor and low wealth people, however, make up 30% of the electorate now. That's 64 million people, poor and low wealth. We already know that prior to COVID, 43% of the country was poor and low wealth. Since COVID, it's over 50%. But 34 million of the poor, 64 million poor and low wealth people did not vote. The very essential workers that Trump and McConnell are hurting in their legislation. Now, poor and low wealth people didn't vote, didn't vote because they're apathetic. We did a study called Unleashing the Power of Poor and Low Wealth Voting, and we found they didn't vote, number one, because politicians don't talk about poor and low wealth people. Number two, they can't get off work and transportation and transportation needs and number three, voter suppression. We also found in that study that in 15 states, even in the South, if just one to 19% of poor and low wealth 
people voted that didn't vote last time, they could exceed the margin of victory in any race from the governor's races, Senate races, all the way to the president. In other words, they could change the outcome of the presidency and the Senate. Let me name them for you. Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, New Hampshire, Arizona, Minnesota, Maine, Florida, New Mexico, North Carolina, Nevada, Georgia, Texas, Mississippi, Ohio, Ohio. Just one to 19% of poor and low wealth people, regardless of race, creed, and color, organized around an agenda can fundamentally shift American politics and can call for a full addressing of these five interlocking injustices. So we are the change. We are the change and we're charged to be changed. Black people, Latino, native, poor, Asian, coming together. We have the moral and political power to change the moral and political direction of the country. And that's why in the Poor People's Campaign, we are building. In June this year, June 20th, we gathered online. We didn't march in the street because of COVID. We gathered online and 3 million people joined for a mass Poor People's Assembly moral march on Washington. We wanted to challenge the narrative the mythology that we don't have the money. We wanted to put a face on the numbers of poverty. And we call in poor and low wealth people, moral allies and their advocates to honor, to honor the power they have and to use it. And we decided in June, we're not gonna wait anymore. Yes, since 2016, we've had all these presidents debates. Not one of them had dealt with poverty. Not one of them had dealt with racism. For one hour, 30 minutes, but poor and low wealth people all over this country are saying, we're no longer going to wait for you to say our name. We're going to make you hear us. So we're organizing in Appalachia, in the mountains of Appalachia, Kentucky, and West Virginia. We're also organizing in the Southlands of Mississippi and Alabama, bringing people together from Carolina to the California. We're bringing people together from the Kansas farm lands over to North Carolina. Fast food workers are hooking up with farmers and finding uh, that, that they are in the same, dealing with the same issues, that together we must address these five interlocking injustices. This is a moment, this is our moment. And I know sometimes people get depressed by what they're seeing now, but let me share with you something as I close right here, something that was worse than what we face. Justice Taney was forced onto the Supreme Court in the 1850s. And Justice Taney became Supreme Court just Chief Justice. And he presided over the Dred Scott decision. And the Dred Scott decision was decided in March of 1957, 1857. And it said a black man had no rights that a white man had to honor. Many people said, that's it. The abolition movement is over. We might as well go somewhere and quit. There's no need to try anymore. Frederick Douglass was asked to speak on May of 1857 in Rochester, New York, about this situation. And he, this is what he said. Listen carefully. He says, on one view, the slaveholders have a decided advantage over all the opposition. It is well to notice that advantage, the advantages of complete organization. They are organized. And yet they were not at the pains of creating their organization. The state governments are with them. The, the, the federal government is with them in slavery. The churches are with them in slavery. All of the forces, the courts, the Supreme Court is with them in slavery. The, the police force is with them. And it's all pledged to defend and propagate the curse of racism and human bondage. The pen, the purse, and the sword are united. He said that, but that's one view. Then Frederick Douglass said, and I thank God it's only one view. There's another view, it's a brighter view. He said, David, you remember, looked insignificant and small when he went up against Goliath, but looked larger when he stood over Goliath and he laid slain. He went on to say, let us see the other side. Let us see if there are not some things, even in this moment, we can cheer and can move our hearts. He said, the Supreme Court of the United States is not the only power in this world. It's a great power, but the Supreme Court of the Almighty is greater. He said, Justice Taney can do many things, but he cannot perform impossibilities. He cannot bail out the ocean. He cannot annihilate the firm old earth. He cannot pluck the silver star of liberty from our northern sky. He may decide and decide again, but he cannot reverse the decision of the Most High. He cannot change the essential nature of things, making evil good and good evil. Such decision cannot stand. God will be true, though every man be a liar. 
we can appeal from this hell black judgment of the Supreme Court to the court of common sense and common humanity. And then we can appeal from man to God. If there is no justice on earth, there is yet justice in heaven. You may close your Supreme Court against our cry for justice, but you cannot thank God close against him the ear of a sympathizing world, nor shut up the court of heaven. And then he says, as monstrous as it appears, we can meet these decisions with a cheerful spirit. This very attempt to blot out forever the hopes of an enslaved people may be one necessary link in the chain of events preparatory to the downfall and complete overthrow of the whole slave system. The whole history of the anti-slavery movement is studied with proof that all measures devised and executed with the view of, al of al uh, to ally and diminish the anti-slavery agitation has only served to increase, intensify, and embolden that agitation. My friends, those of us who know the pain of systemic racism and poverty and ecological devastation, the war economy, and racist white, and white nationalism, in a sense, those theories have tried to reject us. But like Frederick Douglass says, it must instead embolden and intensify our agitation and the rejected rejected all over this world. We come together in a mighty force politically and morally. We have the power to push this nation toward a more perfect union and toward a more genuine democracy. If they didn't stop then, if Frederick Douglass didn't quit in 1857, if Mother Jones didn't stop fighting for women's suffrage in the late 1800s, if Rosa Parks and Ida B. Wells and, and, and James Reeb, a white Unitarian, and Rabbi Heschel and Martin King, they faced times much worse than us. But instead of it causing them to be depressed, it emboldened, it intensified their agitation. Let it be so with us because America, to be who she claims to be, needs a third reconstruction, a poor people's campaign and a moral revival to address the issues of systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism. The soul of the nation is in the balance, but we can change things. We must change them and we will. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Barbara, for those wonderful remarks. Uh, because of time, we're going to kind of reserve the questions and we will send it. Uh, hopefully, you can respond through social media through the 300. Uh, but you hit many of the um, questions through your remarks. Uh, for those of you who have to leave, and we do understand um, time is sensitive. Uh, Reverend Barbara has a video for those who, who can stay that will last about four minutes. And for those of you who have to leave, we thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us for the, our 22nd year of doing this lecture series. And um, thank you for bringing much wisdom, insight, and inspiration to all of us today. And now we're gonna take this time to show the video um thank you so much i hope the president can have my name and number so i can she'll give me a call i'd like to speak to her okay. somebody give her my number okay what happens in wall street often doesn't say a thing about what's happening on the real streets of america everybody everybody has a right has a right to live to live the poor people's campaign a national call for moral revival has come up with a series of demands. I know that you are here for the same reason we all are here, to put our elected official on notice. Yeah. The pain and the discontent is real, and the demands of our movement are moral. We know what we want to focus on. Our agenda is clear. We demand an immediate implementation of federal and state living wage laws. We demand, we demand the right for all workers, right for all workers to, form and join unions. to form and join unions. We demand, we demand 
equal pay, equal pay for, equal work. for equal work. We demand, we demand a guaranteed annual income. We demand fully funded anti-poverty programs that protects the welfare of us all. We demand the expansion of Medicaid in every state. We want single payer university health care, not for some, but for everybody. of the Voting Rights Act. We demand an end to racist gerrymandering. We want early registration of 17 and 18 year olds. We want registration to vote at age 18. If we can be drafted for war at 18, we ought to be able to vote automatically at 18. Early voting in every state, same day registration, and the enactment of election day as a holiday. We demand a reversal of state laws that prevent municipalities from raising minimum wage. We demand an end to mass incarceration and the continuing inequalities of black, brown, and poor white people with the criminal justice system. We demand the right to vote for the formerly incarcerated. Yeah. A clear and just immigration system. This includes providing a timely citizenship process that guarantees the right to vote. Yeah. The First Nation, Native American, and Alaskan Native people retain their tribal recognition as a nation, not a race. We demand decent housing. We demand relief from crushing household, student, and consumer debt. We demand equity in education. We demand an end to the resegregation of schools. We demand free tuition at public colleges and universities, and an end to profiteering on student debt. Equitable funding for historically black colleges and universities. We demand the repeal of the 2017 federal tax law. And we demand that the wealthy and corporations pay their fair share. We demand an end to military aggression and warmongering. We demand a stop to privatization of military budget and any increase in military spending. We demand a ban on assault rifles and a ban on the easy access of firearms. We demand an end to federal programs that send military equipment into local and state communities. We demand that the call to build a wall at the U.S.-Mexico border be ceased. We demand a ban on fracking, mountaintop removal, coal mining, coal ash ponds, and offshore drilling. We demand a ban on all new pipelines refineries and coal, oil and gas export terminals. We are demanding that we stop the war on our poor. Somebody's hurting my brother, somebody's hurting our sisters, and it's gone on far too long, and we won't be silent anymore. We believe, we believe that we can win. We believe, we believe that we can win. We believe that everybody, everybody has a right, has a right to live, to live, to live. I want you to know that when hands that once picked cotton join hands of Latino, join hands of progressive white, join faith hands and labor hands and Asian hands and Native American hands and poor hands and wealthy hands with a conscience and gay hands and straight hands and trans hands and Christian hands and Jewish hands and Muslim hands and Hindu hands and Buddhist hands, when we all get together, 
We are an instrument of redemption. When we join hands, we can revive and make sure that the promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and equal protection under the law is never taken away from anybody. So I got a question. Are the rejected ready to revive and declare this land is your land. This land is my land. This land is our land. And together, from the state house to the white house, the rejected are going to demand that this nation never give up on being one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Reverend Barber, for giving us an absolutely wonderful lecture. Hopefully, this won't be the last time that you come through, come back to the Buckeye State. Um, we can easily convert you from a Hoosier to a Buckeye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been such an humbling experience. And I, I pray um, that uh, what we've done, I want to try to send you all the full lecture uh, with footnotes. Um, so that you'll have it in your archives and that so people can uh, can refer to them um, as we seek to build towards a more genuine democracy. Thank you. All right. Good night, everyone.